Great. Thanks, David. Um, so today I'm going to talk about addiction treatment. It's a talk um, I modified just a little bit for this, um, but we've heard some of it before, so I'll try and expand on it a little bit. Go ahead and for the next slide. I think it's just a disclosure. I don't have any conflicts. So the, uh, today we're going to review just briefly uh, DSM-5 criteria for uh, substance use disorder. Um, I, I'm going to try and give you a little bit of a sense of what it's like in the addiction treatment world um, in trying to determine what kinds of services people might need. So the patient placement criteria I'm going to talk about, not something you're going to use yourself that much, but just to give an idea of what addiction treatment looks like and what kinds of uh, considerations go into making a decision about where people should get treatment. Um, the addiction severity index, I think, is a helpful um, uh, uh, a helpful measure, not that you're going to use it in primary care, but again to understand some of the dimensions of addiction and, and what might be going on with some of your patients. And then uh, specifically, just because it comes up so often, opiate addiction treatment with methadone and buprenorphine. Uh, next slide. So um, this is the DSM-5, Substance Use Disorder Diagnosis. There are 11 criteria, and uh, some of it is new, although mostly it's just a combination of what used to be uh, substance dependence and substance abuse. So they basically took all those criteria, took away one, which is substance-related legal problems, which is no longer a criteria, added one, which is craving, um, and craving, you can ask patients uh, such a strong urge that you could not think of anything else. Um, that's uh, one way of asking about craving. And then the only other new feature is that tolerance, and it is relevant to pain treatment, is that tolerance and withdrawal, um, if it's induced by a prescribed medication, that is taken as directed no longer is a criteria for a substance use disorder. Um, however, that's only if those are the only criteria that exist. So if people have other criteria, um, then actually tolerance and withdrawal also count. And that, um, But it is a little bit of a, uh, I think, an appropriate change in the criteria that there are, are medications that people take as directed, and uh, they shouldn't necessarily, if they induce tolerance and withdrawal, count towards a substance use disorder diagnosis. Um, other criteria there um, are pretty familiar, but and ones that seem to come up a lot in the pain situation is uh, many patients do want to try and cut down or stop their opiate uh, for pain, often they'll perceive that as because of pain they're trying uh, they're unable to do so. But it's sometimes convenient to use that um, criteria if your goal is to try and get folks treated for an, uh, an addiction. Um, and then taking more than intended, spending a lot of time dealing with it, um, and then. Uh, sort of role function problems. Those are the criteria for substance use disorder um, that that are important to keep in mind. And we seldom go through this whole checklist, but more use a conversation to get at uh, whether there are problems with function related to substances. Next next slide. So the, the ASAM, American Society of Addiction Medicine, is a, a group that has worked a long time on trying to codify and systematize um, the criteria by which patients get placed in addiction treatment. So basically trying to assess a patient's needs so that uh, the, the right intensity of addiction services can be provided. And it does incorporate a range of dimensions, the biopsychosocial dimensions, severity, progress in treatment, um, all these are incorporated into the patient placement criteria and really intending to try and individualize treatment, um, which takes place over a, a, a broad continuum. Next slide. So the patient placement criteria have all these dimensions. Um, you can imagine how this might work with intoxication or withdrawal potential, whether it's alcohol, 
benzodiazepines, opioids, that, that the kind of uh, severity of that potential withdrawal, if people have had alcohol withdrawal seizures or whatever, you know at that point that you're going to need some more significant medical detox um, if you're going to get someone into treatment. So uh, intoxication and withdrawal sometimes trumps uh, other dimensions when the goal is to try and figure out where to start with treatment. But other issues like medical complications, if they're sick in some acute way or chronically, say with liver disease, can affect also the initial uh, assessment and, and treatment, um, especially if the goal is, is detox. Um, uh, um, and then the other dimensions, um, we talk a lot about psychiatric issues um, and how, how acute and severe they are, um, where, whether people are being coerced into treatment, their stage of change in terms of their readiness to quit, um, relapse potential, um, and recovery environment. And I, I think that this is um, something that really we, uh, if, you, if you're talking to a patient who is interested in getting an addiction treated, um, this recovery environment where they live now and who they're living with and whether that environment is conducive to recovery is really, is often a branch point for deciding whether whether they can do outpatient treatment, whether they might need to actually leave their environment and go to an inpatient um, treatment. Next slide. So the, the levels of addiction service, and again, this is the um, patient placement criteria divides uh, treatment into these levels. Um, outpatient, um, which can be detox, but um, mostly is outpatient in a clinic going to an addiction, a specialized addiction services. Um, this is not saying what kind of treatment they're going to get when they're there, but more the level of care and uh, outpatient can go anything from once a month up to um, when it gets to uh, like three times a week for a couple of hours. That's called intensive outpatient. Or and around here we don't have much in the way of partial hospitalization programs, but there are some in other parts of the country. So intensive outpatient is really um, a couple of hours three times a week, so a pretty big commitment by patients. And then, of course, residential or inpatient treatment is, is full-time, all 24-7 kind of thing. Um, and then uh, the, the medically managed inpatient thing is mostly related to some programs that try and do their medical detox and then move them directly into inpatient. Um, that would be uh, someone who has a more severe withdrawal potential. Um, and then um, sort of uh, alongside or in parallel with these levels of addiction services are um, co-occurring disorder treatment. Um, basically, um, any of those uh, level one, two, three, or four can can be either addiction services only or uh, what they call dual diagnosis capable. That means they have some um, ability to deal with mental health problems and then dual diagnosis enhanced or refer to people who um, have severe mental illness as well as addiction. And so there are sort of three different levels. And that's more in the setting of, okay, and now I know that they need outpatient treatment. What else do they need? And if it is co-occurring disorder treatment, then you'd be looking for programs that have more dual diagnosis services of, available. So that's kind of the overview of what addiction treatment programs, and pretty much all programs will fit somewhere in this continuum. Um, next slide. Um, and then I, I've added this slide um, to just talk about treatment of addiction in primary care because um, there's increasing interest in this, um, especially around the integration of addiction services into primary care as we look at um, models of medical care that are looking at a po treating a population because many times in, um, when you start doing capitated services, you notice that the patients who cost the most, um, who need the most care are people who have both medical <laughs> problems and addiction problems and trying to get them treated in one spot rather than making it kind of difficult for patients who have to now go to care maybe in three different locations for their mental health, their addiction and their medical services is not very likely to work, and so there's a lot of interest in how to integrate these services. We know from uh, very um, robust literature that brief intervention is effective in primary care settings for 
uh, patients who screen positive, who are identified by screening and who have unhealthy alcohol use, um, but also patients in, in, who don't have an alcohol use disorder. So um, that's a, a actually a pretty large group of patients who show up in primary care who drink too much but don't have a disorder. And brief intervention is, is well established. The United States Preventive Services Task Force actually recommends screening in primary care for alcohol um, because of, of the effectiveness of brief interventions. Um, if you look at that for drug problems rather than alcohol, unhealthy alcohol use, you find um, very little evidence of effectiveness of brief intervention. So we haven't figured out how to do that, um, and uh, we, that's an, another topic. But um, the idea for integrating into primary care is really also based on um, a, a lot of evidence around medication management for both alcohol and opioid use disorders that having a pretty simple uh, pharmacotherapy regimen without a lot of bells and whistles like specialized addiction care might have is just as effective as using medications in a specialized setting. So um, it's also true that specialized addiction services, I think there was a recent study that only 25% of uh, specialized addiction treatment programs actually provide medications for the management of addiction. So um, we really have a parallel system. Neither one works very well. Um, but primary care may work just as well as specialized addiction when you're talking about medications for alcohol and opioid use disorder. So buprenorphine and then naltrexone or acamprosate um, or disulfiram for that matter for alcohol. So the big question in primary care is really how do you do this? And I think you can think of it um, uh, like you might think of a diabetic whose hemoglobin A1C is 9 or 10, that um, you need a little bit of extra help as a primary care doc. It's pretty difficult to get patients who are sort of engaged in treatment or not, not doing well on after uh, sort of simple um, advice about their diabetes. Um, they may need a uh, collaborative care kind of model um, that's also been described and very effective for um, treating anxiety and depression in primary care. Yeah, the doc can prescribe the medication, but you need somebody else, uh, whether it's a behavioral health person or a nurse, to kind of track patients, make sure they're still on their meds, that they're tolerating them, giving them some encouragement. And I think this is the model um, for uh, integrating addiction services into primary care that is most promising. And there have been some studies and more on the way um, looking at these models. Next, next slide. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the addiction severity index. It's, it is a, a well-validated, it's widely used in addiction treatment programs to assess how bad is somebody's addiction. Um, I'm talking about it um, mostly to give you a sense of what people look for when they're trying to assess someone's addiction and how bad it is. Um, it, it is used in many programs for treatment planning, so you can um, kind of match services depending on the patient's need. Um, uh, and it, it, it assesses severity in six different domains and the need for patient services. It does, this isn't something you're going to do in your primary care practice, as it does require some training and time, um, but uh, it gives you a sense of what's going on in addiction treatment. Next slide. So these are the ASI uh, Addiction Severity Index domains, um, medical problems, psychiatric problems, looking at drug and alcohol use and how much and in, in, um, in the past. Um, employment, really, um, how, this is getting at the effects of addiction on employment and work pattern and um, as well as driving and, and how they manage um, dependence in their household. All those are very highly affected by drug and alcohol use, so end up being a good measure of the severity of addiction. Same with legal problems, whether people are on probation or parole, how, how much time incarcerated or if they have charges pending. And then um, the f family and social is really uh, a combination of a history, family history of addiction, which is uh, a quite a strong predictor. And then where they are in their current living situation in terms of folks who are uh, also using drugs or alcohol or 
or not. Um, uh, the medical and psychiatric uh, components there are things that we generally have on our problem list, um, and whether and how bad they are does um, is it a feature of addiction in a sense that there's so many medical conditions that are caused by addiction, psychiatric conditions that are associated or caused by addiction that these end up being important domains as well for um, assessing addiction severity. Um, next slide. So uh, I'm going to just move on to talk about opioid addiction treatment because it um, comes up a lot in our pain patients that maybe these patients are having trouble with their opioids and maybe they have a history of addiction. And it is pretty clear that um, in our societies. Um, uh, exuberance over using opioids um, for the treatment of chronic pain, that the people who uh, have gravitated towards obtaining those opioids seem to have a, a higher uh, um, higher risk for addiction and mental health problems. And so we sometimes have ended up treating patients who have pain and addiction in the medical setting um, for pain because that was easier for them or um, it's, it's kind of what happened. Um, but addiction treatment um, can be very helpful, especially for opioids, because of the effectiveness of medications. Um, when I say highly effective option for heroin or prescription opioids, I mean that compared to um, not using medications or trying to do a detox um, uh, because those uh, modalities, uh, the non-medication assisted treatment options for opioid addiction are really poor. And there's actually many decades of, of um, outcome data that demonstrate that, um, how, how poorly detox works for opioid addiction treatment and the need for medications. Uh, to, to, and, and when you do that, you don't treat everybody, you don't get 100% response, although you get pretty close to a 100% response in terms of opioid use as it goes down, but you may have other problems that um, go along with opioid addiction or um, are other substances that patients are addicted to that are maybe more difficult to treat. Um, it's important to understand that programs, um, that uh, treatment programs for addiction that don't deal with opioid addiction with medications often have difficulty treating patients who are on opioids. Certainly, if they're prescribed them, that's difficult to get them into treatment. And if they're addicted to opioids, they're going to have trouble without medication. So many of the addiction programs that 75% of addiction programs that don't use medications, those programs are going to have a tough time with patients addicted to opioids or patients who are prescribed opioids for pain. So if you get that positive toxicology for cocaine a few times and you're worried about the patient's cocaine addiction, um, you're not going to be able to treat that independently of treating the opioid issue. And then um, many patients who uh, are on higher doses of opioids, especially have multiple problems, sometimes addiction associated. And those patients really are very difficult to treat in the medical setting with opioids for pain, but they can often be treated much more effectively in an addiction treatment setting. And I really, obviously, we look out for these patients and try and get them appropriate care. Next slide. So methadone treatment um, is methadone maintenance treatment for addiction is is pretty much the gold standard for um, a, a opioid addiction treatment. We know a number of things about that treatment, like that higher doses in this setting improves outcomes. Um, that's uh, in contrast to higher doses of pain treatment of pain, pain medications of opioid pain medications in the medical setting, which seems to be associated with worse outcomes and more side effects and, and bad outcomes. Uh, but in the methadone maintenance program where <laughs> patients are getting that medication observed treatment on a pretty much daily basis, um, higher doses actually work better. Uh, longer treatment duration is probably the, the best predictor of outcome in methadone treatment and really in any addiction treatment that longer is better. Um, psychosocial services also improve outcome, although um, some psychosocial services are better than none, but really a lot of psychosocial services doesn't seem to buy you very much more than a moderate level. So um, it's not 
necessarily true that more is always better in terms of the intensity of, of counseling or, um, or monitoring. And then there are poor outcomes when people are discharged from methadone treatment. The best data is that about 80% of patients who are discharged from methadone will be back using within a year. Um, that, does, that doesn't mean no one can ever get off methadone, but it needs to be done in a very supportive way. And the trials that have been done trying to get people off of methadone um, by providing more support during a detox have, have not shown it to be effective. So if you can't be in any hurry. So those trials are pretty short term. They're like over six months trying to get people off methadone um, and comparing that to uh, either maintaining them or supporting a detox. And those, um, this, the maintenance strategy is superior. Um, that's, that said, um, there are patients who can get off methadone with a very long and drawn out kind of uh, dose lowering and taper. Next slide. So methadone maintenance does have a lot of limitations, and it's why a lot of patients resist it. Obviously, there's limitations in terms of where they are. They're not always available, especially in rural areas. But they're also very structured. Six days a week, the patients are going, um, and so they may resist going that often. Um, there's limited clinical flexibility, uh, so there are rules, and they don't flex much. Um, they often don't have much in the way of medical services or mental health services. And really, it is quite stigmatized, this treatment modality. It only exists because it really is very effective. And if you try and close your methadone maintenance program in a particular area, it's often the police that come knocking on the door and say, no, no, don't, don't, don't do that. So um, methadone programs may also resist accepting pain patients. So if the patient is calling up and saying, I'm a... I'm a, I, my doctor won't prescribe any more pain medications. I have a pain problem. He said to come here. Um, that's not likely to work. Um, it, it may be that daily dosing is not so good for pain. I'm not so sure. Um, it seems to work pretty well in patients who have both pain and addiction. Um, but they don't really have any resources to treat pain. It's not what they do, um, and so they don't know. They know how to adjust methadone in order to treat addiction, but it really um, they and they don't necessarily collaborate with physicians very well. Um, some programs better than others. You kind of have to make an effort as a, a physician or a provider, a medical provider, to to work with the methadone programs, get the release of information signed, and, and actually have some collaboration. But uh, many patients with chronic pain do quite well in methadone maintenance, and you can focus on the non-medication treatment and the non-opioid medications that can be effective on top of opioids for treatment of pain. And the patients are much more stable when they're not running around using other, other opioids. Next slide. So um, a few things, if you do have patients in methadone treatment, it's really important to talk to them about it, encourage them in their, um, to stay in uh, treatment because we know that duration of treatment is the best predictor of, of a good outcome. So you could get some information by finding out how, how their urine tests have been recently. They only get tested about once a month. So if they have had a few positive in the last few months, that's not a good sign. That means they're probably using pretty consistently whatever is in their urine. And uh, getting the sense of how often they're going to the clinic is probably the best measure of how stable they are in methadone treatment. If they're going twice a week, even three times a week, that's actually um, takes many months of stability and not using other drugs and not missing appointments. So uh, patients who are going less than the six days a week and are starting to have more take-home doses, it's, a, it's a, the best measure of stability and treatment. And then what are they doing with their dose? Are they uh, being overly aggressive trying to get off the medication or um, is the dose, have, have they been resisting an increase in dose, therefore they're continuing to use opioids um, but not wanting more methadone? That's something you want to talk to them about and try and encourage them to go up on the dose. You really want to advise people to stay in treatment until all those areas that we talked about in the addiction severity index, all those are very stable um, that they have social, uh, medical, psychiatric, legal, and family issues that are 
are are are really a lot better than they were when they ended up in treatment because going into treatment very often all those dimensions are unstable. Um, you don't want them to try and taper off methadone until things are looking good. And then there is the possibility that you can get more and more take-home doses. Um, every, every program really goes to weekly. Um, some programs even go to once a month uh, dosing of methadone. And um, then it's just like taking a medication and going in one, in one, to a pharmacy. It's really um, much easier and people have a lot more freedom if they do it that way. Next slide. So a uh, quick run through buprenorphine treatment for opioid addiction. Um, there was federal legislation back in 2000 that allows office-based treatment of opioid addiction. Um, if physicians are, and um, this is not nurse practitioners even now, uh, they're not allowed to do this, but physicians can complete an eight-hour training, get a waiver from the federal government um, so that they can use certain medications for the treatment of addiction. Um, and I really encourage people to take this training even if they're not going to prescribe buprenorphine for addiction treatment. I think it is helpful to understand opioid addiction um, and and how it, it relates to chronic pain, and I think it helps your skills um, in treating chronic pain to have a better understanding of addiction. And really, if you do decide to do buprenorphine, I think if you talk to people who do it, it really is a, a way that you sometimes can turn people's lives around in a very profound way. So it can be very gratifying to treat patients uh, for addiction with buprenorphine. Next slide. So buprenorphine is uh, what we call a partial agonist. Really all that means is that compared to a full agonist, if you keep increasing the dose, um, the activity at the opioid receptor has a ceiling effect or a plateau, and that um, level of, op of uh, receptor activity is um, not associated with um, stopping breathing, so it's a little bit safer than full agonists. Um, Buprenorphine um, in its most common form is, is in Suboxone, which has buprenorphine, and also Naloxone, uh, which is an opioid antagonist, but uh, it's there primarily as an abuse deterrent so that if you take the medication under the tongue um, like you're supposed to, then the Naloxone is not absorbed, and, um, and if you shoot it, um, crush it up and shoot it, then the Naloxone can cause a withdrawal reaction. But um, the buprenorphine itself, um, it has this partial opioid activity, but it also has very high um, mu receptor, opioid receptor affinity. Um, so that means if it's there, then other drugs are blocked and other opioids are blocked. So uh, the buprenorphine itself and not the naloxone is what blocks other opioids, but it, um, it does turn the receptor on enough to keep people out of withdrawal. And um, and is safer than a full agonist, especially safer than methadone. So it can be prescribed in an office-based setting. People can go to the pharmacy and get it, unlike methadone for addiction treatment. Next time, next slide. Uh, we can skip that one. I kind of went over that stuff. Uh, buprenorphine has been shown. Uh, like methadone to be superior to psychosocial treatment alone or non-medication uh, assisted treatment. Uh, longer duration is better than shorter duration, just like methadone. And um, the drug use outcomes, if you have patients on buprenorphine uh, and methadone, are pretty similar. Um, although buprenorphine is not as good as methadone at retaining patients in treatment. It's about a 15 or 20% difference. Uh, we don't really know why that is. It may be because buprenorphine is easier to withdraw from, um, so people don't have as much withdrawal, so uh, try and end their treatment prematurely, or, um, or maybe that because uh, of the way buprenorphine works, if you are, uh, are not in withdrawal when you start buprenorphine, um, you can have a precipitated withdrawal reaction, and that uh, may, uh, that certainly does, if it happens, uh, push people away from buprenorphine treatment. There are a number of issues in prescribing buprenorphine that um, you have to figure out if you're going to do this in your practice, um, who you're going to treat, where you're going to get your referrals, and how you're going to select patients, how you're going to monitor them. Um, if you're going to do induction, induction actually 
uh, does require a withdrawal assessment. You have to be able to tell when somebody's in enough withdrawal to start it, although there are now um, some home induction protocols that work pretty well and seem to work just as well. So you don't necessarily need to induce patients in your office, but um, that's how it's usually suggested for people, especially when they're starting to prescribe buprenorphine. And then you have to figure out what kind of uh, treatment you're going to require beyond the medication, how they're going to pay for it, and how you're going to decide when to stop. And these are uh, none of these are rocket science. There's a lot of people who do it, but um, it does take some commitment to ma developing protocols. And if you have a nurse or um, uh, someone to help track patients, that's really helpful. Next slide. And then getting started with buprenorphine treatment, there is a physician clinical support network um, that provides mentoring. Um, you can get mentoring also through um, through uh, us at UW and through me. Um, the buprenorphine.samsa.gov website has um, a list of the trainings. There are online trainings that are free, um, and there are um, so there are a lot of resources on that website. Um, and then just in terms of trying to figure out who to refer to uh, a, a doctor for buprenorphine, and I've, I've discovered through getting a lot of these uh, referrals is that it's often best to try and discuss it uh, doctor to or provider to doc to doctor or provider to provider um, consultation like we do in telemedicine um, may be more effective than trying to refer someone with a question of does this person have an addiction um, that that can be a very difficult consultation to perform especially if the patient is really defensive and not not buying it around their um, potential addiction addiction. So um, often telemedicine is the best, or I'm happy to take um, email, or, or, or uh, we can arrange times to talk about some of these patients. Next slide. So um, addiction treatment, addiction issues are really an important aspect of pain management with opioids. Um, if you're going to use opioids, I think you need to know some about addiction and its treatment. Understanding uh, that system can help you when your patients do decide that they want help, whether they're on opioids or not. And um, addiction treatment can be very effective um, uh, and it is available uh, more or less in various parts of the the state, um, but uh, I think increasingly as we start to uh, integrate addiction treatment into primary care, it's going to be more available. And then providing that treatment yourself, I think, is very gratifying and can really help you have an option for uh, patients who are particularly difficult to treat with opioids uh, without sort of firing them or sending them away. So um, I think that's the last slide. Next next slide, I think, is just uh, if you want more about COPE REMS, um, that's the site to go to. I'm happy to take questions or, uh, uh, or discussion. Thanks.